Welcome to the Shun Podcast, where we expose religions that use shunning as a tool to control people. Today we're going to meet Chloe. Chloe's family was in the circuit work, but her family also had a lot of pressure in the house. Pressure that she'll describe in a way that will put you right there. Pressure that perhaps you felt in your home if you too had a particularly volatile parent. Chloe, like so many, lived a double life and ended up getting married young to another J-Dub. Today, she shares custody of her daughter with that Jehovah's Witness, and at my request, she provides some really amazing advice for others in that same situation. I know there are a lot of people out there uh, who are listening who probably are in a situation where they have a child and share that custody with a witness, and it's not an easy situation to navigate at all. So there's a lot of things here that I'm sure you're going to relate to on some level, regardless of whether or not it's in the parenting aspect there or co-parenting or just uh, Chloe's life in general. And she offers a lot of uh, offers up a lot of wisdom in this interview. Uh, Be sure to stick around after the interview. You'll find out where you can watch Chloe's live performance that she's developed about her life, uh, which she's actually going to mention in the interview. And you're also going to learn more about the music that you're about to hear before her interview and the clip directly after her interview as well. Uh, Those are things that I don't normally have in there, but they're in there for a reason. So without further ado, let's meet Chloe. My name is Chloe Smith. I'm 34 years old. Um, I was a Jehovah's Witness, and I am shunned. All right, Chloe. So how did you become one of Jehovah's Witnesses in the first place? I was actually a third-generation witness. So both of my maternal grandparents and my paternal grandmother and then my mother and father are witnesses. So I was born into the cult. Um, My... Mom's parents uh, were uh, very high up in the organization. Um, Lots of times you'll hear witnesses telling experiences where, uh, you know, the wife is studying and the husband is staunchly opposed. And Mm -hmm. that was the situation with them because he was like super Catholic. And it goes where, you know, the husband says, I'm going to bring my priest and you bring your elders and we'll see how that goes. Right. Right. And so that's what they did. And, um, after that, since the witnesses totally, you know, shut down his priest, he decided that that was the truth. And so he got involved and got baptized and all of that. So, they were, but, you know, being staunch, it's kind of like with, uh, Saul turning into Paul, you know, the, the zeal for one thing, it just converts over and turns into ultra zeal and another thing. So they were really hardcore into it. And, um, when I was 12, they went into the circuit work and, you know, everybody loved them. Everybody knew them. So there was like this image that my family was like this perfect witness family. Wow. Um, yeah, that's a lot of pressure. I'm, I don't think I've ever spoken to anyone who had relatives who were in the circuit work like that. I, I can only imagine how much pressure that that puts on everybody else down the line. Yeah. Yeah. And interesting enough, my mom had four brothers and they were all disfellowshipped by the time they were adults. Oh, wow. So she was the only one. So it was like a lot of pressure on her. Um, you know, she was the the good girl. And then she and my father and my father, you know, they had us. I have two sisters and we were like supposed to be this perfect family in the congregation, which is rarely an accurate depiction. But yeah. So then um, what about your your dad's side? How did that go down? Um, On my dad's side. uh his dad was never a witness. And by the time I was born, his wife, uh, my grandmother, who was a witness, had died of apparent suicide. Uh, 
Mm. Um, but our family, so our family moved in with my grandfather and my father's childhood home. And so he was, you know, what the witnesses call favorably disposed, you know, he respected their religion, he accepted them, but he just didn't want to be in it. And so he died when I was 12 and my parents still live in that house now. So my dad's lived in the same house since birth, basically. And they're still doing their thing. He is, you know, the, uh, now they call it the coordinator. Mm-hmm. And my mom is the elder's wife and my sister's the pioneer and all of that. And you say you, you have one other sister as well? I have two two sisters. Yeah. I have an older sister who's three years older than me. And, um, so my childhood, it was really the two of us. Um, and my younger sister was, is 12 years younger than I am. So, um, she had kind of a different experience than we did. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, growing up as a witness, I think one thing people need to understand is that there is no exposure to any other way of life Mm -hmm. or belief system. So, you know, being a witness to us was the normal thing. Uh, And it was like, oh, well, this world is full of miserable, misguided, lost people. They're in the dark. And we have the only right way of living. And so we're the fortunate ones and it's too bad for them, but it's all so binary. It's all very black and white. Um, So as a kid, I had a hard time with that um, because I couldn't really understand the idea that the other children I knew at school were like bad somehow. You know, I I was friends with them. I I wanted to be friends with them. Mm -hmm. And that was really hard to do because, you know, you hang out at school and then the play date invitations come and you have to be like, oh, I can't play at your house. I'm not allowed. I remember one time I like very not artfully. I was like, oh, I can't be, you know, I was probably like eight or so. And I I can't play at your house because you're bad association, you know? (laughs) It makes no sense. Um, <laughs> Tact isn't uh, something that a child often has. Yeah, we just we just kind of repeat what we've been told. Well, which sure. Is a big... Sure, Go but it, you know, isn't isn't it isn't it you know weird the way that you know, like you talked about being a kid and having to see these other kids as bad associates or different or whatever. You know, just it just makes me think. Just last night, my wife and I went to a hockey game locally, and. Uh, while we were sitting in in our seats in the bleachers, we saw these this group of witnesses that we used to know. Uh, of course, you know it's been years since we've seen any of them, but we saw them walking by, and it was just funny to to sit there in a group of people and to know that we're all watching the same game, we're all rooting for the same team. Uh, there's kids playing in front of us. It's it's honestly it was quite the family atmosphere. It was it was a lot of fun. But here's this group of people over here that are separating themselves out a- as mm-hmm. different because it-, it has to be something that you you are able to put on. It's it's like you know wearing a mask or putting on a costume uh, of a Jehovah's Witness in order to be different because otherwise, like there was literally there's no nothing. Difference. Yeah, there's no difference. There yeah. was nothing about any of us there that made us any different from one another. Except for these, these, it was like it was like four or five people over here. We know my wife and I happen to know that they think they're different than everybody. <laughs> yeah, you're doing the same activity. Yeah. You have the same frame of mind. Yeah. You're watching the same thing. You're feeling the same reactions, but you are doing it as an inherently evil person, yes. and they're doing it as inherently good people. Yeah, and how hard and is so that to put on as a kid? You know, as a kid yeah. to, to, to be that, I mean, it's almost, I don't know if bigoted would be the right word, but it, it's, it's almost, it, it almost is that because there's such an us versus them mentality that you have to be able to put on as a kid. Well, I don't remember. It was you actually, <laughs> I'm going to quote you to you. Oh, that's fine. You, <laughs> made, you made the point, uh, in one of your, this JW life podcasts that, um, what, the witnesses are basically rooting for is 
global genocide, mm -hmm. which will make them rejoice. Yes. So it's like they'll be happy to see all of these other people just be slaughtered, you know? Yeah. So, so it's just such like it's like lots of cognitive dissonance involved in this religion, you know? It's like it's it's hard for a human to really feel that way. You had to be super brainwashed. Yeah. And uh, so, like, even as a kid, that was hard. But then once you get into, like, that teenager, like, you know, middle school and then high school, that was where it really got difficult because I feel like that's when most kids, and me definitely, um, were starting to figure out who we are like oh, yeah. okay that's who my parents are but who am i mm -hmm. what do i stand for what am i passionate about and what i was finding in myself was that i have this open and free spirit and i'm liberal and i believe that there's beauty in everyone and um in all different ways of life and it was so frustrating because I could not express that. I And that's when I started to learn to really kind of lock up my personality uh, because otherwise I would have gotten into trouble. I would have been labeled as bad association within the congregation. Yeah, that's I, I love that you said lock up your personality. That's that's quite a, a visual uh, I don't know. It's just quite quite an appropriate description. You know, you can almost see like a kid with a locker or something. You know, well, here's my personality. I'm gonna leave it over here and put it in this little lock box, and then mm -hmm. I'm gonna get gonna go walk and and be somebody that I'm not. That's a very yeah. descriptive way of putting it. And it's a really hard way to live. It's like uh, it it's a it's torturous. Yeah. And so. I can only maintain that for so long. And I think that happens with a lot of witness kids. And that's why um, it's such co a common term within the cult to say a person is living a double life. <laughs> yes. Because at a certain point, you cannot, you can't do that anymore. You have to let it out. So um, once I was old enough to drive, I hit the double life and I hit it hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had my worldly best friend and I had my witness best friend. I had my worldly parties and activities. Um, you know, I smoked, I drank, I did all the stuff I made out with boys. And then I was like going out in service, being a perfect witness, but it's like a high anxiety type of life too. Oh yes. Um, yeah, because you're always worried that somebody is going to catch you and, and you have so much to lose. You have so much to lose. And, yeah. you know, interestingly, though, at that point, you're so young and immature that you don't really, and since you've been oppressed for so long, mm -hmm. not even the worldly part of your life is really healthfully expressing you. Well, that's true. Yeah. You know, because it's, so, kind of, it's kind of overcompensating probably on some level. It's just your way of trying to get it out. So um, I was really being false, not just to the witnesses and my family, but I was being false to the non-witnesses because they didn't truly know me either. I just pretended to be just like them and I wanted to be normal, but I wasn't. So from both sides, my whole life was really a lie. Yeah. So, so can I ask it's you? It's not happy. No, no, not at all. Can I ask you? So then, what was your? Let, let's talk. So let's talk about the witness part of your life. Um, mm -hmm. First of all, as a as a girl, as a female woman, now, but you know, like as a girl growing up, you have limited um, limited upward mobility. There's not a mm -hmm. lot that you, that you can do in the congregation, but you can give you know, your talks or demonstrations and things like that. I know that, I know that you have a, a, a um, I don't know if I want to say theatrical bent, you know, you like your performance mm -hmm. art and things like that. So did you, did you find any freedom of expression or did you enjoy maybe uh, as a young witness, you know, being able to get up and give demonstrations and do things like that? Like, was there something in it for you doing all that? 
There was, um, but it has to do with my specific family dynamic. Okay. So in my family, um, like, for example, I remember one summer at the convention, we were on stage as a family demonstrating how a witness family should discuss the daily text. Mm -hmm. And it was pure mockery. Our, like, we didn't do that. <laughs> I know, and, I've been there myself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, but um, the best way I can describe the environment in my house is um, if you imagine a balloon and when it's fully inflated, this balloon is big enough to fill all the space in your entire house. Right. So, okay. you know, it's pressing against the walls. It pushes the tchotchkes off the furniture. It's pressing and inflating and inflating like it blocks the air ducts. Nothing can move. Okay. Even air can't move. And my, we had such a balloon in my house and it was filled with my mom's emotions. Mm -hmm. And so my sister and I are just trying, we're like squished up against the wall trying not to pop it hmm. because it's not fun being squished up against a wall and not able to move and express yourself, but it's better than what would happen when the balloon popped. Like, and you know, you don't really, I don't know how accurately I remember the frequency of this because I kind of just remember it in like flashes and snippets. But it, as I remember it, at least once a day, um, my sister, or I, or my dad in his absence, because he was never there, like something would just trigger her and that balloon would pop and what came out of it was absolute toxic waste, you know, from inside of her. Like, so she would scream until like she was foaming at the mouth, you know, she would jump up and down. The I remember the window panes rattling then she would start grabbing things and throwing them at us or beating us with whatever she could get her hands on she would lose her voice we're stupid we're ugly we're incompetent we're unwanted she's gonna kill us she's gonna run away um it's it was really really terrible i remember this one incident where she threw you know those old um like from the 70s the ceramic white mixing bowls with like the rooster on them <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah i remember she grabbed it and she threw it at me and it hit my face and my nose started bleeding and i got in trouble for bleeding onto the carpet God. so she was very unstable and so like we were afraid of her and well, yeah. there was, yeah. <laughs> and there was no, no level of being a perfect goody two shoes that could get her approval. And my father just ignored us because he had a lot of congregation responsibilities, right? So other families are getting his help. Our phone was always ringing. It's always for him. Uh, yeah, of course. So he's gone, he's doing that stuff and we're at home like we're in the lion's den, like crying out to God to shut the mouth of the lion yeah. and God is busy helping the other sheep. So I was a goody two shoes. Like I wanted any approval from adults that I could get. Well, heck yeah. So, so like if I had an assignment on a theocratic ministry school, I crushed it. <laughs> like <laughs> I wanted that, uh, what do they call, um, E or, I know W is work on this. Oh, was there a G for good? G for good. Maybe? Yeah. Yeah, yeah something, something like, like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I always got the good. I always got to move on, and then people would tell me I did a great job, and I loved that. Well, of course. I mean, because in, in your house, nothing is ever good enough. And here's one aspect of life where you can finally shine and get some approval. Yeah, exactly. That was a very big deal to me. Yeah. And just how, you know, I don't know if you, I'm sure you've thought about it, but just how un, I guess I just want to point out that, you know, what your mom had become is not, 
um, it's not indicative of what every witness parent is, but it's also not so abnormal as to yeah. not exist in probably most congregations. So you just see the pressure that these people are under and how mm-hmm. it makes them snap. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's too much. It's way too much for people. And it causes mm-hmm. real problems. Yeah. I mean, she definitely had her own issues, yeah. but they were exacerbated so much by the fact that my dad was never there to help her with us. Yeah, he was probably and, escaping himself. Yeah, and by the fact that so much was asked of her as an elder's wife, there were probably a lot of factors there. Yeah. But um, either way, it didn't matter to us. All we knew is that this was happening to us. Oh, and yeah. At the time, we didn't know why. And as an adult, I'm like, oh, she was losing her mind. Yeah. And I could forgive her for that. And actually, as an adult, she apologized. She felt so bad about it. I was a terrible mother. Mm-hmm. And it's like, it's fine. I forgive you. I love you. And we ended up having, she's still crazy. So, you know, in order to have a relationship with her, you have to manage it in a certain way. Like, right. this is what you can talk about. Never bring this up. You know, that kind of You're thing. You're walking on eggshells still. Right. But we had a working relationship. And um, when I needed her, she was there. You know, sometimes you need your mom, right? Sure. So, but... That's such a weird dynamic, but I'm sure that I'm not the only one who's experienced it, which is why I bring it up. Oh, no, I'm sure you're not. And I really like the balloon analogy. Uh, I really like that a lot. Um, I, you know, because you, you, it just really helps you see these, these poor kids, you know, smushed up against the wall, <laughs> try, uh-huh. trying not to do anything that might cause just the slightest hole in this balloon because there's so much pressure there that it's going to annihilate everything when it goes off. So Yeah. Um, yeah, there was so much pressure. So it was kind of interesting growing up like that. Um, in school, it was, uh, <laughs> I was such a... I was the teacher's pet. I was a goody two-shoes all through elementary school. Um, but one thing I did not do is witness to people there because I was really ashamed of, of that. Um, and I think that that's pretty common, but I was, I used to ride to school with my, you know, your best friend is based on proximity when you're that age. Mm -hmm. So we had witnesses that lived in the apartment upstairs and her dad would drive both of us to school. And I remember we were maybe in like the fifth or sixth grade and she had an assignment to do an oral report. Well, you know what that means to witnesses. You're going to stand up there. <laughs> you're going to find a way to make the topic fit you giving some sort of um, a witness to your class. You know, right. get your information from the society's literature and all of that. So he was telling her, you know, she should do this. And she said, I'm not doing that. And he said, you sound like you're ashamed to be a witness. And she said, I am. Oh. Most awkward moment ever. <laughs> but I envied her so much yeah. for saying that because I couldn't do that until like 20 years later. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah. I think we all wanted to be that kid. <laughs> to, yeah. To be able to speak our truth just once, just to say, yeah, this is bull you know or or, you know I don't want to do this or I am ashamed because we we all were ashamed on some level that's why they had to have parts constantly talking to us about you know are you ashamed (laughs) to be one of Jehovah's young witnesses at school well yeah we all are (laughs) yeah I love being ostracized for being different for no good reason yeah this is you know like no everybody hates that idiot it's like (laughs) <laughs> and that's why I'm so glad my daughter gets to go to school and be popular and normal. And I know being popular isn't important, but she is, you know, and like. Well, it's just being liked, if nothing else. Yeah, she's liked. She participates in the things. And it, it's like, I just, it's like healing to me that I can do that for her, you know? Yeah, oh, heck yeah. I can only imagine how much. Um, I don't know, redemption maybe there is, or if that's a proper term for a lot of parents who are ex-witnesses who get to have their own kids and give them a different life, um, a more normal life. 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, we are so into the holidays yeah. and all of that stuff. But, you know, talking about being ashamed um, it made me think of this story. When I was like maybe 18, I was real deep in my double life. I didn't live at home anymore. Um, my sister and I, understandably, like the day after I graduated high school, I moved out. So we lived together. And so I would, um, I had this worldly boyfriend and we would go, you know, to parties and things like that. So I went to this, um, keg party, uh, at one of his friend's houses and it was just like a backyard barbecue with a keg. It wasn't like people were doing keg stands and all this craziness, (laughs) you know, it was just like a normal get together. And we were talking and, uh, the person who we were talking to asked about my religious background and I felt like, uh, this really visceral panic reaction. I actually turned and physically ran away and i i i was hiding behind my car when my boyfriend found me we had to leave and it was like that intense shame of being identified as a witness plus the guilt of being such a bad witness i just i couldn't deal with it i physically ran away from it it was like that was one of the worst moments, the worst feelings I've ever had in my life is that fear and shame that like really kind of hit me all at once. That's a lot to put on an 18 year old kid. Yeah. So like all of this is going on. I'm smoking pot. I'm smoking cigarettes. I'm going to these parties. I'm running around with my worldly friends. And during that time, my, uh, grandparents were in the circuit work, uh, in Jacksonville and they set me up with a pioneer and a ministerial servant that they had kind of taken as their pet. And, um, marrying, I married him and I didn't break up with the other guy until the day before the wedding. It was just the whole thing was crazy. I don't oh, know why. Wow, that's an interesting because you were living a double life anyway. So what's another double life, right? Right. Let's just add another level to it, right? Wow. So, um, and it was a long distance relationship, so he was never there, and I was being absolutely a terrible person. But whatever. So, but my escape, because once you're there and you're in love with someone that's worldly, and you're kind of reaching critical mass it's like a decision point. Mm -hmm. And my solution was to physically leave and go to a completely different state. (laughs) Uh, You ran away again. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I ran away. Um, and so that's kind of, yeah. You know, you think, well, I'm just going to pluck myself out of this situation and then everything's going to be perfect. I'm going to be perfect now. Right. So, and that's what happened. You know, I moved here and I committed myself to being like perfect sister peace. You know, I had like this excellent reputation in the congregation. Everyone thought we were this perfect couple. couple. So um, that was kind of the way I fixed that problem. (laughs) But it was by creating a much bigger problem, being married to someone that I never should have been married to. Yeah. I think that happens a lot too. Oh, yes. So let me ask, so how long did you all, I don't even want to say date because we know that in the witnesses, the, the term dating isn't used a lot. So how long did you all court? I'm going to sound really old. <laughs> yeah. Um, he wooed me. <laughs> uh, we dated for eight months, yeah. uh, long distance, and then he came up. A week before the wedding, we got married, and the next day I moved down here. It was just very fast, um, very... My my brain, as you can imagine, was just like a blender. Yeah. There was just so much going on, but... um, And and we, we liked each other. 
he's gorgeous. Um, he thought that he liked my free spirited outgoing nature. Um, and he's a generally good person. Um, we just had nothing in common. So, you know, we got married, I get down here and it's like my emotional state went way, like I spent most of the marriage in deep depression and, you know, at first it was a lot of homesickness and withdrawal from my worldly life. Mm -hmm. Um, so I went to therapy and I really worked hard at acquiring that excellent reputation for myself in the congregation. Um, and you know, my ex and I, we never argued ever. People would say, oh, the first year of marriage is the hardest. And we look at each other like, I don't know what they're talking about. We never argue. Mm -hmm. We never had drama. But that's because we didn't care about each other at all. <laughs> like, I don't care what you're doing. You know, it's I, true. <laughs> no, it is. I heard one time, um, oh, there's a saying, and it's something like, if you never argue, that's because one of you isn't being their true self. You know, mm -hmm. in other words, somebody has to either... Either you've gotten, like in your case, two people who just didn't really care about each other, or you have somebody who is just appeasing the other person. Like arguments yeah. are a natural part of a relationship. So, yes. you know. Yes. The only thing we ever would discuss was, um, like, whenever I talked to him about things that I felt guilty about, he was always so nice. Like. He went to bat for me, you know, with the elders when things would come up. Um, he empathized with me when, you know, I told him, you know, I'm bisexual. I feel so bad about it because I know it's a sin. And he was like really supportive. Um, but when I told him, this is how I feel that I need to be loved. This is what that looks like to me. Which, you know, that's a pretty standard thing to want to tell your partner. Yes. Um, he would say, you watch too many movies. No one's like that. That's, that's not real. Mm -hmm. And I know that that's because that's how his family was. You know, he, it wasn't, they weren't like that. Um, and so he didn't have that emotional side to him. He, he or, didn't know empathy. Is it, would that be correct? That would be, he would tell you himself that he doesn't possess the ability to show empathy. Um, I was that feel, guy, so that's why I'm asking. <laughs> yeah, I remember reading that about yourself, actually. Yeah, but, yeah. Not, not having any clue, um, because we were brought up in such a narcissistic environment that, and we all had to push our, our true feelings aside so much that I think we all, a lot of us got very numb. You switch it off. Yeah. Very much. Yeah, yeah, you switch it off. I remember asking him um, if he saw me as special. And he'd say, I love you. You're my wife, but you're not any more special than anyone else. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that doesn't seem right to me. <laughs> so I ended up feeling really alone, especially with my demons, you know, like. So after um, about nine years of marriage, I had my beautiful daughter and I went into all I can explain it to you, like, um, her name's Amelia and she's perfect, but like I had her and Amelia and I went into a room and closed the door and her father was on the other side of the door. Like we became our own little self-sustaining mm, gotcha. thing. That's wrong of me, but I wasn't alone anymore. We made each other happy. Um, but then, you know, they grow up, she, which they're supposed to do, and she got more independent. She started school, and I started feeling that, like, oh, I need something. You know, I need something else. Um, so, you know, he never got jealous. Even when I was obviously pursuing another relationship, and he knew it, and you would have to be blind not to see it. He never got jealous or even acted like anything was wrong. You know, it sounds like he didn't probably have the emotions to even do that. It sounds like he was that numb. 
That is exactly true. And I think if you're going to get through a life where your emotions and feelings and opinions and thoughts don't matter, Mm -hmm. you have to do that. And I couldn't. And so I couldn't. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's healthy of you. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It means that you probably dealt with a lot more pain uh, in the moment. But whereas, you know, he was pushing his down, but eventually it will, it catches up to most people. It will catch up to you. Yeah. So let me ask you, did he ever know about your, like you said that he went to bat for you in different ways with the elders or whatever, but like, did he ever know about your double life that you had had for, you know, most of your you know adolescence, I guess, or teenage years? Yeah, I did tell him about it. You know how, um, the the guilt yeah right yeah so once i came here and you know this was the only when i came here and like fully committed to being sister peace i mean no one studied more thoroughly than i did you know my margins were like full of my on my <laughs> watchtower and um so i was so immersed in it it's like it woke up that um, conscience that had been brainwashed into me. Oh, okay. Yeah. And it started torturing me. I just felt sick. So I talked to him about it and he was like, it's in the past. You know, it's okay. It's in the past. And then I talked to the elders about it and I felt, you know, absolution. So I could move on. Um, but do you know how fun it is to sit with, uh, let's see, two elderly white men and talk about, oh, well, what was it? Was it a blow job? Was it a hand job? Like, did you enjoy it? Um, you know, like, yeah. no. It's so degrading, but that's just part of the process. They need to put you in a place where you feel like so tiny Mm -hmm. that you need them to lift you up. And this is your, you, you need Jehovah. I am a piece of garbage. I need Jehovah. I feel so degraded and so small. I need Jehovah. And I think that's part of the manipulation with that. Oh, absolutely it is. Absolutely. I mean, they, they sell the problems or they create the problems so they can sell mm. the cure pretty much, you know? Oh, my God. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm sorry you had to go through that. I, I I never had to, but I've heard, I mean, I've had to go through many elders meetings over uncomfortable things, not mm-hmm. that particular subject matter, but I, I've heard so many stories of people who've had to do that. And that just seems like, I mean, it's all boundary crossing, but that in particular is just, it's unconscionable. I, don't, I just don't understand how yeah. they, how, how anybody thinks that's healthy. <laughs> you no, know? it does. What difference does it make? What the answer to those questions are? I, no. You know, I mean, it's like this, I did something wrong. It was sexual in nature. Yeah. Help me. Yeah, that's. I was going to say like, that's all you need to know, but honestly, they don't really even need to know that. <laughs> yeah, no, they don't. It's 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 just you're trained that these are your gatekeepers, yes. these are your police, these are your father. This is your mother and your father, and your authority and everything. They hold the key to being spiritually healthy. Yeah. And so, anytime you don't feel healthy spiritually, you go to them and they'll fix it for you. And so you just do whatever they say. You know, you go to the doctor because you're sick and he gives you medicine. You take it because he knows what he's talking about, right? Mm -hmm. So that's like what the elders like, well, something's messed up with me spiritually. I'm going to go to the elders and they're going to tell me what to do and it's going to be fixed. And did they fix it for you? I'm just, I just wonder, like, you know, when you walked out of any of those meetings, did you, did you feel relief because maybe they had just said, Hey, you know what? It's in the past, whatever. Or did mm-hmm. they reprove you or something that was there something that made you feel better in some way? In that case, um, I did feel better because it had been like five years and I wasn't doing it now. 
Yeah. And so there was no reproof. There was no privileges taken away. It was just they really did seem to care about, oh, Sister Peace is in agony over this guilt, and she doesn't need to be, and we're going to help her move past it. So that I felt like, you know, and I was kind of in grief for a couple of days. I cried. I read the Bible constantly. They told me, you know, read the Psalms. And, and David wouldn't understand how you feel, that kind of thing. Right. Um, so it did make me feel better. Um, but now looking back, I know that none of it needed to happen in the first place. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You only like felt if, bad because of what they had pumped into your brain in the first place. Yeah, exactly. So that kind of led me to um, the end for me, really, with the cult. Gotcha. So I also wanted to ask you now, did you, so, you know, when you hit that 18-year-old mark, you know, somewhere around there, did you ever go to any kind of extra schooling or did you, you know, get a job or, you know, leading up to this, to getting married? And I don't know if you said how old you were when you got married. Um, just wondering, you know, was there, because you, you you got that little bit of independence there, did you mm-hmm. have a period where you, you know, got to experience, I guess, you know, kind of life outside the cults? In... No, I only did self-destructive things with oh. my freedom. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I wasn't. I knew for a fact I wasn't allowed to go to college. My parents are very old school gotcha. witnesses. Um, I mean, even now, if your kid goes to college, people will talk about you sure. behind your back. Uh, so I wasn't allowed to do that. And that really discouraged me because I would, well, I'm smart. And when I was in school, I was really smart. And I knew that, like, I knew that I could go far if I tried. But uh, I couldn't. I wasn't allowed. There was no money for college. There was no support. There was no. So and I knew how harshly I would be judged. I knew my parents wouldn't let me go. And so even though I would have been technically an adult, that hold that they have on you, it doesn't just expire once you turn 18 and you're suddenly, you know, oh, I'm going to make all my own choices based on what I want. It doesn't work like that. So. I didn't get any extra schooling. Um, I started working when I was 14 and I worked, um, I became kind of a workaholic because it kept me away from my parents. Mm -hmm. I understand Uh, that. So yeah, that's, that's what I did. And, um, it did help. (laughs) <laughs> you know, yeah. like I, the less you're around them, the less yeah. they can, they can be terrible to you. Absolutely. Yeah. So, all right. So back to you. So you, now you're a parent and you've, you've got this daughter, um, Amelia. Mm-hmm. And, um, you said that when she was, you know, starting to go to school, you, you know, decided that you needed something. So what did you start to, how did your life start to go from there? Well, I I was working part time. My husband had an excellent job, uh, where technically, if I if he was if he controlled, he had a lot of expensive habits and hobbies. Not habits. That sounds really terrible. <laughs> <laughs> hobbies, okay. like you know, legit hobbies. Yes, yes. Um, so he would spend a lot of money on them, but. Um, if we were more careful, I wouldn't have had to work at all. But before I had Amelia, I decided I want to go to school and be a massage therapist. And actually, that was a major deal for me because, you, and I'm sure this applies to a lot of people who aren't even in these types of religious environments, but you know, you're going through life and it's just kind of like one thing leads to the next thing. And before you know it, you're like, how did I get here? And Mm -hmm. like, um, I didn't choose this. So when I decided to go to massage therapy school, that was the first decision that I really ever made for myself. And so when I followed through and there were some challenges to it, um, I got 
like really ill, had to stop. Then I got pregnant and I had to stop. But I finished. And that's still my career. And I'm excellent at it. I love it. I'm And it brings me a lot of success and satisfaction. And I've been able to be a sole provider for my family with that job. And so it was, it kind of gave me a taste of choosing something for myself and that satisfaction that comes from following through and doing something because you chose it. <laughs> yeah. That's that a beautiful a thing. Deal. Yeah. And how yeah. old, how old were you when you started that process? Um, 27. Isn't that, isn't it amazing the, the way, you know, the witness lifestyle kind of, uh, represses you to where you're 27 years old before you finally start taking some, you know, doing like the first thing that you want to do. You know? Yeah. And it was the fact that it was such a big deal to me. I was yeah. also kind of significant, like, uh, okay, whatever you're changing jobs. Who cares? Like, <laughs> and I was like, no, this is a really big deal. Yeah. And I got criticized in the congregation for that. Like massage therapy is a legitimate and, um, there's nothing wrong with it. It's a great career. You're sure. helping others. But people are thinking, you know, well, you're going to be touching people who aren't your husband. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, like, it was just, I got criticized. You're going to be one-on-one -on -one with members of the opposite sex. And we uh -huh. all know as Jehovah's Witnesses what that always leads to. Yes, and always. Always. Every single time. <laughs> if I'm alone in the room with a man, we will be having sex within 15 seconds. <laughs> of course. Yes. It's just natural. What do they, what do they say? Like, um, your urges will take over. And before you know it, you had sex and you didn't want to. And I'm like, who the, who does that happen to? <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't, I mean, it happens to all the drunk, it, yeah it happens to all the repressed human beings who are writing those articles <laughs> that's who it would yeah. happen to yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so repressed that if I'm in the room with a woman that is I'm having sex it. with her yes. it's happening <laughs> yes yes that's but, the yes. writing committee <laughs> yeah it was a bit of a scandal but it's okay I I got to, you know, they got over it and I've been doing it for years. But, um, the original question that you asked me was about, you know, looking, okay. Yeah. So I didn't get to go to college, didn't get to do any of that. So I only used my freedom and my double life to do destructive things that hurt me. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, you know? that, that's what a lot of people ended up doing. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's the, you know, because we weren't taught, we did, we were given zero tools emotionally or mentally we weren't given any experience in the real world so you know most people don't have much healthy to turn to all we had were you know, unhealthy things or if you know maybe maybe if we were lucky enough to just happen to be around some super healthy people but you know that doesn't happen a lot when you're a kid when you're pretty young so, you know, they're just, they really set you up to fail. Well, you know, um, that really brings me to something that when I was planning to talk to you, um, was a main point that I wanted to convey because I feel like it can help a lot of people mm -hmm. and it has to do with what we're talking about, um, and it's the reason why children lead double lives. The reason why, or, or one reason why, and one reason why children get discouraged and depressed and stop trying. So when, as a parent, you set impossibly high standards for your children, and no matter what they do, it's never enough. We're good for nothing slaves. What we've done is what we ought to have done. Mm -hmm. Like, there's always another council point to work on. There's always something that, um, can you expand your service by doing this? Why aren't you using your vacation to auxiliary pioneer? Uh, why aren't you using your time off to join the RBC? Why aren't you applying for temporary work at Bethel? Why aren't you applying to go to Gilead? Why aren't you, you know, just the list is endless, right? Yes. So you can be 
such a good kid and tries so hard, but it's never going to be enough. And you can do that for a while. You're going to try for a while, but eventually when you, you don't get that approval, you never get an attaboy, you never have arrived, you know, you say fuck it and you just stop trying and uh, it's, you know, you get discouraged and you give up. And so you stop trying and you, you start living that double life because who cares, right? But the thing is, in your double life, like even when I think back on that time, because that's why I did it. And even when I think back on that time, um, I think of the worldly part of my life as darkness. And that's even now that I'm happily worldly. That time, it was darkness for me because like you're just saying, you're doing all these things, but you have zero parental guidance. So for example, like my hus- my current husband, um, his parents were like amazing liberal weirdos, right? So he could be like, dad, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm having sex or dad, I smoked pot or I wanted to smoke pot or I want, or this is going on. And his dad could be like, okay, son. And you know, this, uh, Americana life magazine moment of his dad being like, well, don't be stupid. And this is how you do it so that nothing bad happens to you. And, you know, so you don't have that. So it's very dangerous. It's very dangerous. And So I really feel like setting and enforcing, and I know non-witness parents who do this too, um, extremely high or unattainable or perfectionistic uh, standards for your children is really damaging to them. It's going to hurt them. They're never going to feel like they're good enough for you. And so That's one thing that I've learned that has helped me in my life because with my daughter, it's not about getting perfect results. I mean, she does all the time because she's brilliant, (laughs) but like, (laughs) but that's on her, you know, like, I don't care about that. Like, it's about the journey. It's about experiencing life and developing good qualities and trying your best. It's not about, um, these are the rules that you have to live up to. Um, and maybe, and she's spoiled and I'm too lenient with her, but she's a loving, kind, gentle, uh, well-behaved, polite person. And so it's fine. You know, it's, it's working out fine because I just, I don't want to put that on her because I know how harmful it is. So that, that's kind of like the big thing that I've been thinking about a lot lately and how it, it, the, the cult plus my crazy parents, you know, really, um, that's a really harmful thing to do to your children. Absolutely. Um, because it really, it creates only one path for the child. Mm -hmm. There's only one path. It's prescribed from birth and they must follow that path. And if they don't, anything less than that is failure. And Mm -hmm. even if you did it all perfectly, you're still not good enough because there's still more you could do. So there's you're never, ever going to get that attaboy. Yeah. And this is never happening. When it occurred to me was when I realized that I repeated that exact same pattern as an adult before I left. I don't want to infringe on your next question, uh, but you can say whatever. Go ahead. So, well, um, my leaving, my waking up, Mm -hmm. um, in my judicial committee, I remember telling them I had never once been happy in my whole life and I have to try. I have to try. I'm sorry. And I was 32 years old. And what got and I, you to the judicial committee? Well, how I ended up there was, no. <laughs> uh, it's kind of interesting. So I always had kind of this artsy bent. So I went to um, a beginner's figure drawing class. We have a beautiful museum in Jacksonville, the Cummer Museum Art and Gardens. Mm-hmm. And they host a lot of things like this. And the teacher was this brilliant local portrait and figure artist named Tony Wood. 
And um, I was a little shy, but I hung out with this kind of bad girl in the congregation. And she put her hand up and said, do you need models? Because my friend here would be perfect. And I was really happy that she did that because I, I, I'd always wanted to do that. Whenever I heard about that being a thing, I was like, oh, my God, I want to do that. That would be so great. So he said yes. And he was super professional. He was also I was 32 and he was 59 when we met. So it wasn't like anybody thought he wasn't going to be professional. Mm-hmm. But. The first time that I modeled for him, so he has a small studio in like this major arts district place. And um, so I'm standing there and he was going to do a photo shoot and then he paints from the photos, right? So paused for about three seconds, like, okay, I'm going to do this. And then I just like took my clothes off. And as soon as I had stripped all my clothes off, all the fear and anxiety completely evaporated and that day I felt something that I had been looking for in my whole life Hmm. it was like and it wasn't okay so it was like he was seeing me like who I really am and not just because I was naked not just the outside but he could see me and I felt understood and seen For the first time in my life, I experienced total acceptance Mm. in that moment. And I became addicted to it. Because if you think about what I've been going through, you know, keeping myself locked up. Then to be seen for who you are and celebrated for it, totally intoxicating. When I left there, I felt like I was high. That is fascinating because it's it's the opposite of – it's – it's vulnerability mm-hmm. instead of this this always walking around control. with shields up and control. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. he actually, um, he paints, he drew a life-size, I'll send it to you, you can post it. He drew a life-size full frontal figure drawing of me where I look vulnerable because it's full frontal and that's very rare to do, but Mm -hmm. um, I'm cracking the ground with my toe, like an earthquake. Oh, wow. (laughs) And and so it's because you get power from vulnerability. You don't get power from uh, a white knuckle control grip on life yeah everybody sees vulnerability as as weakness or i shouldn't say everybody but there's kind of a natural um bent in this culture to see vulnerability as weakness when really it's strength how can you do powerful things if you are not open yeah to the opportunities and possibilities and what's out there so um I started working with him constantly and we fell in love. And um, once I felt that, I knew I was never going to let it go. But I didn't sleep with him because I didn't want to get disfellowshipped. I knew that as soon as I did that, it would be like throwing an atomic bomb into my whole life. Mm -hmm. So eventually I couldn't take it anymore. So I told my husband I was in love with the artist to which he replied this is so ridiculous he said I'm so sorry that must be so hard for you and I was like what like he was so confident that like my love for Jehovah would make me choose the right thing (laughs) that he didn't he didn't even see this as like a problem for him and he was wrong so I asked for a divorce you know with the elders and it was like well we can't do anything to punish you but obviously strong admonishment to stay together and neither of you can get remarried. They asked if there was someone else. Eventually, like on their second visit, they asked that and I said, yes, but we haven't done anything. So they leave and then the next day they call and say, this is a judicial matter. And so that's when I had my committee and um, I was just fellowshipped for brazen conduct. 
conduct. So uh, even the brazen conduct, you can use the that all for encompassing. Anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Brazen it's, conduct. It's we don't like you. We don't want other people in the congregation to get the idea that they can think for themselves. Yeah. So you got to go. Yep. Um, so, but I'd never been happy. I had to try, right? Like I told him. So I left there, got in my car, drove to the art studio and surprised the artist very much by what happened. <laughs> <laughs> but I was just fellowship. So who cares? And we were together after that. We moved in together. Um, and really the strange thing that really told me a lot about myself was that I never one time for one second felt guilty. I felt guilty about what I did to my ex-husband because yeah. that that wasn't right. But I was sorry to him. I wasn't sorry to Jehovah because I didn't believe that Jehovah was real ever. I never missed the congregation. I never was like, oh, I missed the routine or I missed going to the meeting or I missed the feeling of being there. Um, I never picked up my Bible again. Um, so it really proved to me that I'd never, like the witnesses say, made the truth my own. Yeah, I had never you done were, that. You, you never fully indo- making the truth your own is just indoctrinating yourself. You, mm-hmm. you you clearly never went that far. So that's um, that's pretty cool, really, that you were able to walk away without a lot of those types of, uh, I guess, battles or whatever. That's not to say it was an easy experience, oh, yeah. but um, that was one thing about it that I felt like I felt good about it. It's like it convinced me that I did the right thing for me. Yeah, my wife was the same way. She was able to, you know, like I, whereas I was hung up on all the doctrines and stuff, even after I initially left, I was still still trying to work out a lot of things. My wife was just like, yeah, like this doesn't really matter. <laughs> it just doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, it can be helpful to other people on their journey, which is maybe why part of the reason why you were doing it, but um, or to enforce to yourself that you were doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, if you're not in that religion, it doesn't really matter what they believe in, whether it's right or wrong, because it has nothing to do with you and you're free from it. Yeah, it's something you put on and it's something that therefore you can take off. Right. Because none of us are born. None of us are born Jehovah's Witnesses. None of us were born believing all those things or feeling all those things. Those things were put into us. So Mm -hmm. we can we can get rid of them at some point. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes I would feel stupid and ashamed that I was ever part of that. Yeah. But, you know, um, the artist would say, girl, it's not your fault. You're born into it, and literally every person in your entire life believed this and taught you that this was the only way. Yep. You know, like, what else was I going to do? It's it, it, And it's a trap. And I was in it, and I got out of it. So, um, And my husband has told me that. My best uh, female friend has told me that. And so I'm starting to believe it <laughs> like, and not feel guilty. And, you know... Um, your podcast about like the fog, mm-hmm. the brainwashing techniques really helped me a lot to let go of that. Like, I'm so stupid. How could I have been in that? It really helped me a lot. I was like, no, they legitimately brainwash people. Mm-hmm. These things work. These are psychologically proven brainwashing techniques. Yeah. And they get adults to come out of the quote world Mm-hmm. I mean, like, I even know locally there's a professor who, you know, so you would see him as an educated man, and yet he came out of the world and became one of Jehovah's Witnesses. You know, mm-hmm. this, this doctrine, this brainwashing is so strong uh, that it can get grown people to join. So what, you know, is a kid going to do? I mean, I, occasionally yeah. I'll see a kid, you know, on a forum or something at like 13 who's woken up and and can see it for what it is. And that's, Mm -hmm. that always blows my mind. But, Mm -hmm. um, you know, for a lot of us that were raising it, we didn't really stand much of a chance. It just, no. Did you, um, see, do you ever watch American horror story? No. Mm -mm. So we were super excited because the last season that came out on Netflix is called cult. Oh, cool. And so it's a super crazy, like murder cult, but, (laughs) (laughs) um, you know, there's this couple, and the one 
is in the cult and gets like it gets out of control and she's trying to leave. And so her wife is like, why did you do this? Why did you bring this into our lives? What possessed you? You're an intelligent, um, educated person, you know? Mm -hmm. And she said, my life, I was, there was so much stress, responsibility, obligation. It was chaotic trying to keep up with it. And it just felt good to take my hands off the wheel. (laughs) <laughs> yes, absolutely. And that is exactly what it is because with some exceptions, like probably the person that you're talking about, I mean, there are some people who, this is going to sound mean, there are some people who join the witnesses who have totally made a botched job of their lives up to that point. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a way of absolving yourself of responsibility and handing it over to the cult. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh, you know, others think, well, I don't want to get too off track with whatever you're trying to say, but, um, uh, whatever you're trying to get to, but oh, it's no, just, you go, go right ahead. It's, it's your story. <laughs> <laughs> it's just ridiculous. You know, people don't want to have to make their own decisions. Uh, and that's one of the most vicious lies they tell. Mm -hmm. Um, There are two, you know how you leave and then like, it seems like every day you're having an epiphany. (laughs) Yes. So um, they tell this lie that uh, if you do anything, if, if you trust yourself and you trust your heart, your experiences, your reasoning, you are guaranteed failure, 100% guaranteed to fail. Mm -hmm. But if you trust the organization, well, they say trust the Bible and trust Jehovah, but it's trust the organization, that you're 100%, I've heard these words from the platform, you are 100% guaranteed success. Maybe it won't seem like that in the short term, but in the long term, right? Mm Mm-hmm. But the liberating fact of the matter is nothing is guaranteed in life. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that's guaranteed. Um, So you might as well do like follow what you think and feel and be happy, you know, like because just blindly following someone else is not going to take you, guarantee you anything. No, they're not happy. <laughs> no, they're not happy. They ha- they pretend they tell themselves, but they're not. They're and, not happy. You know, and the other lie that really makes me angry is that they teach you that all non-witnesses are inherently bad. They're either obviously bad, or eventually they'll show you their true colors, mm-hmm. and that is not true. When witnesses are nice to you, it's with the goal of attracting you to the organization. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but when genuinely kind people and the rest of the world are nice to you, it's because usually as a general rule, they're genuinely kind. Yep. And uh, to make you discriminate against so many people based on that lie is uh really unfair well it's really it is and it, and it's one of those things where it's like so many of the things that the witnesses told us about others were actually about them so like they would tell us that you know people who are worldly on the outside are manipulative no mm-hmm. we were sitting in the congregation with the manipulative people mm-hmm. or how many articles did we have about discouragement and discouragement was a tool of satan to stop us from serving Jehovah. Well, where did that discouragement come from? It came it's, from the organization. Mm-hmm. It's not from worldly people because we don't know any. <laughs> right. It was from them or yeah. or the, the whole double life thing. So mm-hmm. your life outside the congregation is seen as the double life. Actually, mm-hmm. the life outside the congregation is probably far more authentic than the one inside the congregation. The double life is the one that you're leading as one of Jehovah's Witnesses inside the congregation. That yeah, is even, the duplicitous one. 
Oh, so much. What people show at the Kingdom Hall yep. is Kingdom so... Hall <laughs> Kingdom Hall personality. So, uh, there. And when I came out, there were a couple things that really helped me. You yeah. know, I was having these epiphanies and I was figuring these things out. Um, and, you know, other people, you know, your former loved ones are saying so many things about you to justify why they're shunning you. Um, I don't know what uh, the, what your rules are about language, but oh, my no, mom, you can say anything. It's a podcast. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, the best way I can encapsulate what, why other people think I left is the last thing that my mother said to me, which was because I'm a fucking whore. And then she hung up the phone. And nice. that's what they think. Yeah. Nice. I'm like, Thanks, Mom. I, I'm like, I am a whore. I am this like middle aged, middle class married lady. Like, I don't, <laughs> I don't understand this. You know, but that's what they say. Oh, because she wanted the temporary enjoyment of sin. Yes. Yeah. Oh, worldly association, liberal lifestyle, independent spirit. It's dangerous. So that's their narrative of it narrative of the whole thing mm -hmm. but like when I was going through this process I think the most crucial thing for me controlling my own narrative and and not thinking those things about myself was that I was in counseling and I would definitely encourage anyone that's going through any part of this process seek counseling and stick with it go every week don't skip it even if you feel great that's the best time to go mm -hmm. because if you think you have nothing to talk about and you're not in crisis mode and you go then you're really going to be able to talk about things underneath all of that surface crisis stuff and you need that especially because mental health professionals are objective and they aren't from the cult mm -hmm. and they can tell you that's crazy <laughs> You know, the fact that they're treating you like that is not normal. Uh, one of the best things my therapist said to me was, because I was all like, what's this going to do to my daughter? What's this going to do to my husband? Blah, blah, blah. And she said, Chloe, I'm only concerned about your happiness here. In the cult, has anyone ever said that to you? <laughs> no. <laughs> Not at no, all. No, that's no. that's the farthest farthest thing from Jehovah's Witnesses. Farthest <laughs> thing. They don't give a shit about no. your happiness. No. So that really helped a lot. Um, a book that helped me was "I'm Perfect, You're Doomed" by Kyria Abrahams. Oh, I've heard of that. Oh, it's so it's funny. It's like a personal essays type of. It's a memoir, and it's you know she's lighthearted. Nothing horrible and depressing happened to her. But um, it's just kind of, I identified it with it a lot. Um, but Kyria made a statement that really resonated with me because when she left, she fell in with a group of artists too. And she said, uh, these uh, godless artists took me in when my family abandoned me. And then she said, when people I knew for 23 years stopped talking to me, people I knew for 23 days helped me move. <laughs> and that is exactly what I found in my new community. Yeah. I felt so accepted, so supported. Um, and I love that book. It's a great one. Another thing that helped me was the XJW subreddit. It just kind of helps you not feel alone. Yes. Um, and this is not... I don't, I'm not trying to flatter you, but honestly, this JW life, that was a major, major thing that helped me. I, li I binge listened to that. And I also shared it with a friend of mine. Like my best friend got this fellowship like six months later. What? Oh, wow. It was awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and it really helped her too. So like, especially that episode, you know, about the brainwashing techniques, but I think it's all about know you know knowing you're not alone validating your feelings yes. and seeing it for what it is that no that was crazy 
this is normal. Yes. That wasn't normal. This is normal. This is good. This is okay. This is healthy. That was the unhealthy life that you were in before. Because it's really hard to change that message to yourself. Oh, absolutely. It makes me think um, <clears throat> there was a, I'm not going to say who it was. Um, there was a family, let's just say, that I knew growing up that were witnesses. And uh, they had adopted a girl. And the, and, and the girl one day is at school. And at school, they're talking, the teacher is talking about sexual abuse and I guess signs of sexual abuse. And all of a sudden, the adoptive daughter is saying, uh oh, like, that's me. Mm. And, you know, so she, I don't remember if she, like, because, uh, you know, I heard it secondhand, but she, like, told a teacher or something. And all of a sudden, that started this whole journey um where the abuse was outed that was going on in this family and and so so on and so forth but what i'm just trying to say is that this girl just saw it as normal this is mm -hmm. what she lived on the daily basis so mm -hmm. for her it took someone pointing out that this isn't how normal families work mm -hmm. and and i know you know for Maybe someone listens to this JW Life or Shunned or the Cedars Channel or reads this book that you've mentioned or read it or whatever. Just seeing other people pointing out that this isn't normal. This isn't what uh, most people experience in life. And it's mm. not because it's a good kind of special. <laughs> it's because no, it's, it's a bad kind <laughs> of special. So you know, just seeing that and, and hearing that it mean it makes a world of difference in people's lives just to know that they're not alone in that pain. Yes, exactly. To hear someone else say, I mean, it's like the me too movement, you know, Yeah. like there were, there's so many people who kept this inside and felt alone. And then people started saying me too. Yes. And it's empowering. And then, then you can stand up and say, Oh, me too. And it changes everything. Just, validation changes everything. So yeah. I got, a, that's what I got from uh, those different resources. It was super helpful. I mean, my, the life still has an impact on me. Um, but it diminishes over time. Uh, like, and so how long, how long have you been out? Three years. Oh, just about the same as me. So. Yeah. Yay. Good for us. <laughs> yeah, it was, a, it was a good time. <laughs> it was a good time. It's weird because, like, you might think of that. It was that first year was the most painful year of my life, but I think of it as like one of the best years of my life. You know, Absolutely. like I got free. But so that first year, when I was really just losing my mind, um, the artist basically carried me through that whole year. Um, the grief. A lot of people would relate to that grief. It's like everyone you know just uh, died in a plane crash or something. Mm -hmm. But it's worse because they do exist. They just don't want to see you. It's hard. Yeah. Um, but he helped me through that, and I helped him in some ways, and then we split up. It was just like time for that to be over. And I met who I truly, like, when I was telling my ex-husband, this is what love is supposed to be like. This is what I want. And he was saying, no one loves like that. Mm -hmm. I know now for a fact he was wrong because that's what I have now. Um, my husband, Nathan, um, we got married last year. He's my best friend. And I really, I didn't believe in soulmates before, but um he is my soulmate. It's this connection, you know, it's a connection on a level that I didn't think was possible. Mm -hmm. And, um, at first when we got together, I would have those moments of, uh, you know, the, what if the witnesses are right? Like the panic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like That's maybe normal. he's the serial killer. <laughs> yes. You're waiting for it to go wrong, but you know, time goes by 
and you know, you know, like the pictures in the watchtower where it's depicting someone who's left, and it's always this girl with like horrible hair. It is and, always a girl, isn't it? <laughs> of course it is. And like, you know, she's sitting and she's like mournfully sad and she, there's beer bottles strewn on her apartment floor and there's like this guy passed out with like a hypodermic needle in his arm and it's just yes. like, this is what's going to happen to you if you leave. Um, but that fades away because I feel like learning to trust yourself and make your own choices. It's a lot like learning to trust another person. So like you you have a new friend and you're learning to trust them. So like every time you call on them and they come through, you trust them more, you build trust. And so it's the same thing with yourself. You learn to trust yourself by doing it, make the decision. Mm -hmm. It works out. And then you learn to trust yourself more. What do what the witnesses say? Prophecy fulfilled, confidence instilled. Well, that God doesn't do shit for that. That's you. So you, <laughs> you set your intention. Yep. You fulfill your own prophecy and you gain confidence in yourself. So the, you know, the fear, that stuff that comes up into your mind that was brainwashed into you about it's all going to go wrong. You've made a terrible mistake. Your life is ruined. If you just keep um, choosing things for yourself and following through and seeing how well they work out, learning from your mistakes, like that fades away. It will go away. Yes. And let's, let's, let's reiterate that part right there about learning from your mistakes. Mistakes are going to happen and that's okay. Like mm -hmm. as a witness, every mistake was magnified because it could mean your eternal salvation or you could be shunned. But in the <laughs> real world, mistakes happen and it's okay. You just, all right, mm -hmm. so I learned a way not to do a thing. Let's try another way. <laughs> and usually it's not announced to a hundred of your closest family and friends. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Chloe has failed at her, you know, whatever endeavor she was pursuing. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know? Yeah. So it's not, you know, let's say you've just left and you make a bad call and something bad happens. It's not because you left. It's because no. everyone makes bad calls. Yes. And bad things happen to everybody, whether you're a witness or not. It's just that when it happens to you as a witness, you have a scapegoat. You blame Satan. Something good happens to you. You don't take credit. You blame. You say it was all Jehovah. Right. No, what Jehovah doesn't do shit for me. Everything good that I have in my life, I made that happen for myself. Yes. And it just takes time to really embrace that way of thinking but it eliminates the old way of thinking. It replaces it. And so that the panic and the uh, constantly worrying if you did the wrong thing, that will go away over time. Yeah. It Absolutely. sucks when it's happening, but just push past it. You're fine. Yeah, I mean, I, I, heck, you, even today, I mean, there's still... I'll get an occasional twinge of, of something, you know, and I do all this, you know, so it's going to happen. It's just a thing that happens to people. Uh, you don't, you don't get rid of decades of brainwashing in a few short years, but it is amazing how much of it you can get rid of in a few short years. If you look at how far you've, how far you've come in just a short period of time. It is amazing. And again, like, I think it's so important to do the counseling and to uh, build yourself a new support system. Yeah. Oh, my God. You cannot survive on your own. Yeah. That's, you know, that's when uh, that's when you start. That's when the emotional blackmail starts working. Right. They want you to be alone so that you'll want to go back so you won't feel alone anymore so you have to like first you have to kind of push away that lie that all worldly people will betray you mm -hmm. and then you have to put yourself out there and I get asked um, a lot 
like when people PM me from like the different Facebook groups, well, how do I make new friends and build a support system and things like that? Because it, when you're in, oh my God, I almost just said the worst thing ever. <laughs> 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 Purge that phrase from my brain. When you're in the cult, right? not the truth, but <laughs> when you're in the cult, it's like, these are your friends because you're forced to see them two or sure. three. If you got in service more, you see them at least twice a week. So you always are in touch. You always know what's gone going on and you socialize with them all the time. But the rest of the world, that's not how it is. Lots of church people have that, mm -hmm. you know? And so if you go and you join another church, that's fine. But that is not my thing. Um, for me, uh, the art community, the art galleries, the art shows, the cultural events is church because I'm going to go there and all my friends are going to be there. Yep. So I feel like what you have to do to start building that support system is find where the people are that are involved and passionate about the things that you're passionate about. And just start going to the events and talking to people. And it's easy because this is what normal, you know, nor before when you were, were talking to a worldly person, you would never think to ask them for coffee or ask them their number or do something. But you can do that now because you're a worldly person too, right? Mm -hmm. So like go to where people are who care about what you care about and make contacts with them and you build relationships with them and you know you see them at these events and at these places and you build a support system it, it it's a little bit slow but it's not as slow as you think oh absolutely yeah. and as you get to know those people those people probably have um things that they do as an offshoot of those cultural experiences or, or, or whatever's going on, you know, they, they probably do their own thing as well. And so you might be able to participate in things with them. It's, yeah, it's just getting out there and getting involved, but it does take effort. Like the friends that we had as witnesses were kind of like, you know, those automatic friends that just kind of dropped in your lap as people moved in or out of the congregation no, you're, you're actually going to have to go do a thing now. You, you do have to try and put yourself out there. And it, it can be scary, but people are so much more accepting in the world. Mm. I mean, they don't care they don't. what your religion is, you know, for, no. to a certain point. It's like they don't care if you went out in service. <laughs> they don't care if you had family worship. Yeah. It's don't just talk like to anybody. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's a relief. Do you remember? I don't know if that, this is everybody or just me, but I remember the first time I had a conversation where someone was talking to me about a, you know, a trouble that they were having. Mm -hmm. And afterward, you know, and I listened and you know it was a positive interchange we we grew closer and they felt supported but afterwards I was like whoa it's so awesome that I didn't have to like break out the bible and you know encourage them from scripture and did you at least keep track of time <laughs> <laughs> oh I'd be marking my time because... <laughs> but but you know it's like I could just relate to them on a human level yes. and I found out that I know things that are helpful yeah just because I'm a person and I care and uh so it once you start making and there's there's bad people in the world there's sure. bad people in the congregation yep so if you think you're making a friend and they turn out to be a piece of shit, whatever, don't let that, don't extrapolate that to all worldly people. Absolutely. Just people will come and go and then there's some people that will stay and that's going to be your people. And you chose them and you like them and they chose you and they like you. Have you ever like thought about the people you were friends with in the congregation and realized you never ever would hang out with those people if you had the option? 100% <laughs> a lot of the people yeah the only people you know honestly I will say that I've, I've been able to reconnect with a lot of people that left 
And Mm -hmm. I really feel closer to them now than I ever did in the congregation. And it's Mm -hmm. not even just about like the ex J dub stuff. It's just that they're just them now that they're just Mm -hmm. people. And we don't have, there's no like constant measuring against one another as far as, you know, moving up the JW ladder or, you know, trying to, I don't know, just, make sure that they're not there to stumble you or, or whatever, you know, it's just, we're all just people. It's exhausting to try to have conversation. Do you remember that part on the convention several years ago um, where it had like all the young men pretending that they were hanging out together, having a conversation and, it was about, so they're all up there chit-chatting, and the one says, you know it would be a great thing for us to talk about, guys? That would be really encouraging. What's your house going to be like in the new system? And it was showing, and then they all actually talked about it. No bunch of teenage guys, <laughs> witness or otherwise, are going to be like, oh, I'm going to do this and that. It'll be so, no, they don't care about that. But it's like every conversation you have to say, well, can I make this into some sort of spiritual conversation or how can I? It's like, uh, nobody cares. <laughs> yeah. Now you can just talk to people about whatever you want to talk about and it's fine. You don't have to try to steer it towards something else or, uh, you know, something quote spiritual or whatever. You just, the pressure is off and we can all just be ourselves. Mm, um, it's awesome. It is awesome. So um, you said that, you know, you, you talked a little bit about how, you know, you, you now have this awesome husband, Nathan. Um, just kind of where are you at now in your journey? Like, I mean, it seems like, you know, you've got a husband and, and you're happy there. Um Just kind of how's life for you now? Um, Really happy, actually. (laughs) Um, I have... um, I have a good job and a beautiful home. And my daughter is doing awesome. Uh, She's in therapy because she's been through a lot. And I want... You know, she has generalized anxiety disorder... So we got her the help she needs, and she's doing awesome. Um, so family life is good, and the you know the marriage is awesome because it's really. I was kind of surprised she wanted to get married because worldly people don't want to get married; they just want to use you for a while. <laughs> but but like he wanted to get married, and it, it we have a. It's just it's peaceful in our home and it's happy and we we each have our pursuits. Like I never knew what my passions were before. Um, and it's been interesting to figure out what they are and pursue them. So, um, I still work a lot with artists modeling for figure classes and for photographers, um, and go to a lot of arts and culture events. Nathan's a musician, so there's a lot of uh, going to see him and his band play and to see his solo performances. Um, I've been writing a lot. I'm working on um, a performance art show about my life called Full Powerless, and I hope to show it in May. And it's a story-based uh, show, uh, where I'm telling stories, um, and there's going to be live music and visual art. Uh, so I'm figuring those things out and collaborating with other artists on them. And that's really fun. Um, and Amelia's got her passions. She's very into ballet. She takes ballet three times a week. Um, I was talking with my, Uh, best friend Zoe who um, has been with me since the beginning of my journey and our relationship has enriched my life so much and uh, I said um, 
because she was kind of down on herself about whatever. And I told her, well, you know, our friendship means a lot to me and that's something that you do that's good. And she said, I don't really think of us as friends. I think of it more like sisters because sometimes you make me really angry, but I always get over it. And that's more what sisters do. And I love that because I had two sisters that I lost and they are my biological sisters and they can't get past things in order to uh, still have the relationship. So like, that's really cool. So I love doing things with her. She's um, a model. She's an amazing fashion model. So I like going places with her because we get all dressed up. People expect something from her, you know. Like, she's got to show up looking amazing. Oh, yeah. So that's really fun. But mostly, it's like every moment that I spend with Nathan, it's so special to me because I know that if I hadn't been brave and uh, endured the shunning experience... I wouldn't have this amazing partner. Mm -hmm. Like with my ex-husband, I never looked forward to the future. It was more like I was serving a life sentence, you know? Mm -hmm. And so at the end of the day, you say, okay, one more day down, infinity to go. But like with Nathan, I'm re I look forward to what's coming next. Even when Amelia grows up and moves out, with my ex, I could not deal with the, thinking about that. But now it's like, oh, well, we'll do this and that, and it's going to be exciting, you know? So, so I don't know. It's a different – it's thrilling. It's fun. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, not to not to derail or to get into anything – I'm not trying to get into anything negative. But so now Amelia was – that was from your previous relationship does she is she still exposed to the witness life and if so how do you navigate that um do you have any maybe like tips for other people that might be going through something similar definitely um i forgot all about that and i'm really glad you brought it up because um, I feel like I'm having a lot of success in this area. Mm -hmm. Now, whenever anyone asks me for advice that is about parenting, I have to preface it by saying, I know Amelia and I know what yeah. works for, uh, right. for us. Right. And everybody knows their own child best. But I think there's some general things that would probably be good for anyone. So um, it's definitely a challenge. It's something that I find myself nervous about sometimes, but that's, that's dissipating. I used to be more nervous because I know when she goes over there because she visits him every weekend and she goes to the meeting on Sunday. So I know when she goes over there, she's with witnesses, uh, learning that lifestyle and the brainwashing is happening. Uh, if anything, her dad leaned in more when I left him, uh -huh. um, you know, the innocent mate and they, you know, shower him. Oh my God, single father, you know, you're a spiritual widower type of deal. Like you're doing this all on your own. You're so amazing. Your ex-wife is so evil, whatever. Yeah, he got a lot of dub cred for that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Big time. He's like a superstar to yeah, them. So sure. so what happens is the first thing I decided was that I was not going to to directly contradict anything that the witnesses teach because it is not my job to confuse her and it is not my job to make her think her father is a liar or stupid. Right. Mm -hmm. So he's going to teach her what he's going to teach her. And I'm in the fortunate position of knowing exactly what that is because, mm -hmm. you know, we know everything about it. So um, 
That was the first thing. And I think that that's really important because anything you do to degrade your child's relationship with the other parent doesn't hurt the other parent as much as it hurts your child. Um, our mediator said something to us that really stuck with me because he had been saying things about me and he had been treating me, you know, obviously like the whore that I am or whatever. Right. So, <laughs> and she said, listen, when Amelia hears you talk about her mother in a negative way, this is what's going to happen. She's going to look in the mirror and she knows she's half her mom and half her dad. And she's going to think, that something is wrong with her. So if you call her mother a piece of garbage, sooner or later it's going to connect that she's a piece of garbage too. And so even though they're in a cult and they're brainwashing her and they don't make their own decisions and all the things that's wrong with that and they cover up child abuse and all of these damaging things could be said about the witnesses. There are a lot of good things you could say about them too. So if I'm going to comment, I only say the good things and I don't contradict the Bible teachings that she's being taught, but I don't reinforce them either. And I try to, I'm not religious. Nathan is a Buddhist, which is like the most non-religion religion ever. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I love Buddhism because it's not about rules or worship. It's about making yourself the best you can be. So I don't contradict, but I show her more. So she associates with all different kinds of people and um, when I talk to her about the, these issues, you do it in layers. So, for example, um, we're driving and we go past a church. This was like two years ago. And she said, oh, a church. And I said, right. And I said, um, Amelia, do you know what a religion is? And she said, no. I said, well, you know what religion you are? And she said, well, daddy worships Jehovah. I'm like, okay. So there's Jehovah's Witnesses, and there's a lot of other religions too. So a religion is when your religion is what you believe about God. So when a lot of people believe the same thing about God, they get together in a group. And they give their group a name, and that's a religion. And there's lots of different religions in the world. So do you think that people in one religion are better than people in a different religion? And she said, this was amazing, but she said, no, because everybody knows something. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was really interesting because it's like, it's not exclusionary. Everybody brings something to the table. And so it's like that. And then we leave it there. And then maybe something else will come up around the same topic. And we can put another layer on it. Like, Amelia, um, how come daddy doesn't celebrate Christmas? Because I am hardcore loving the holidays, right? <laughs> <laughs> but she had the option. I said, I'll still give you all your presents. But if you feel that you don't feel right about celebrating Christmas, we won't do it. And she said, I love Christmas and we're doing it. <laughs> but I said, you know, why doesn't daddy celebrate Christmas? And she said, because he serves Jehovah. And I said, okay, um, how do you feel about it? You know, and that's when I got to explain to her, well, we're not wrong and they're not wrong. We're just different because we're each doing what makes us happy. Um, she asked me another time, can I get disfellowshipped? Which obviously cracked my heart right in yeah. half. Wow. This was recently, like last week. She said, can I get disfellowshipped? And I said, obviously it was like, no. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but, but I told her, I said, no, Amelia. Um, first of all, you have to be baptized first before you could ever be disfellowshipped for any reason. And do you need to get baptized? And she said, I don't need to decide what religion I believe until I grow up. 
because that was something we talked about. That was another layer from earlier and she remembered it. So then it was like, um, okay, right. So even if you do get baptized, you don't get disfellowshipped unless you break one of the rules in the Bible. And um, that's what mummy did. And I broke the rule because God says in the Bible that uh, when two people get married, they're supposed to stay together forever. But I got a divorce from daddy. So I got disfellowshipped. Um, but then I explained to her that I did not want to be a witness and it was a good thing for me that I was disfellowshipped. So it's kind of like I don't contradict him and I, t I always remind her how much he loves her and what a good dad he is. He is a good dad. But I'm not going to, like, I feel like my greatest gift that I can give her is the thing that I did not have when I was a kid. And that is choice. Yeah. So people ask me this a lot, you know, what if she decides she wants to be a witness? Uh, and my true feeling on that is if she grows up and she decides, because that life makes some people happy, truly happy. Mm -hmm. It makes my ex-husband happy because he wants to be told what to do. He said that to me. He said, I want to wake He wanted to go to Bethel so bad because he said, I want to wake up in the morning, have someone tell me what to do and then do it. And now I did right. And then go to bed, you know, that lifestyle and the group atmosphere, the dynamic, the social, that makes some people happy. Um, and some people truly believe in and love God and Jesus. I don't. So what I say is if she grows up and she decides that being a witness truly makes her happy, I'll support her even if she shuns me because of it. But I will not support her getting baptized in order to please her father or because of some other outward pressure. You know, like that's that's all I care about. And I think that... She always tells me the truth. There's definitely like a code switch situation that goes on between the two households mm -hmm. where she tells her dad, I want to worship Jehovah. And then she tells me, oh, I don't care. I don't know. I want to celebrate Christmas. But so he thinks she lies to me. But I really doubt that. I feel like it's the opposite because I feel like in in our house, she knows that I don't care. Like she knows that she all I She has no care, reason to lie to you. She has no reason to lie. She knows that the only thing, so this would be the other piece of advice. Make, make sure your child knows that literally the only thing that matters to you is that they're happy. Hmm. Because the other parent, and you know from being a witness kid, the other parent, the child's happiness is like number three. The most important thing to them is that that child gets under the water before Armageddon comes. Yep. And so since, and, and your kids are not stupid and even at a very young age, they can see that. So like with her anxiety, for example, when she had it really bad, it, she has these little ticks. Like she will blink a lot or wring her hands and that kind of thing. I do the blinking but, thing. <laughs> right. <get> or, it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, blinky. Or she'll be yep. like <laughs> yep. quick to tears. Are you quick to tears? Oh no, 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 no. Okay, but okay. I do have the I, I do I have the blinking tick and occasionally a head shaking tick that I do if I get too stressed. Yeah, it's an anxiety. They yep. have these things. So um the her therapist asked how if she does them, and I'm like, no, she never does them anymore. And her father says, yes, she does. She does it all the time. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, I, I did didn't a lot less this. after I left that crap behind myself. <laughs> uh, yeah. So like, I know I don't say this in front of him, but it's obvious that she feels calmer and more happy in this environment where yeah. it's not that less is expected of her, but less is imposed and demanded upon her in order to make her parent happy. Absolutely. So that's the best I can, that's the best advice I would give is never, ever, ever run down the witness parent ever to your child 
because your child is half that other person. Yeah, it's, um, it seems like what you're doing. I, I'm f- kind of fascinated by this. You're not so the witness presents a binary view of life. Mm-hmm. Um, here, here's the truth. Everything else is false. What you're doing is you're saying so. The witness parent is saying this is the truth, or or even just this is you know what to believe or whatever. And you're saying yes and. Like, yes, yes and. that's a thing. That's a thing. And here's some other things. Exactly. It, you yeah. Know, you're yeah. not shutting anything down. You're, I mean, I guess this even goes to your free spirited nature, really. I mean, you're, you're saying, you know, here's a thing, but here's all these other things too. And mm-hmm. that's all good. You know, like, yeah, let's celebrate it all. Let's, let's look at it at all. And I think that's such a contrast to such a closed minded insular group like the witnesses and that's certainly much more attractive i would think to anyone well i guess i shouldn't say anyone because again there are people who like the black and white aspects of life and they want to fit into whichever one they see is right so i guess that works for some people but but for most healthy people (laughs) um the plethora of life is a beautiful thing and is attractive and i think that's awesome how you're doing that Thanks. I mean, and and like I said, it works for us. But one thing that is universal that um, I'm pretty sure applies to any divorced couple, regardless of the religious situation is the really the worst thing you can do is make them think that their other parent is an idiot or whatever. So um, I never run down her father to her or his beliefs. And I listen to her when she talks about it. Um, and then I just, um, show her more. Yeah. And if he says, Hey, uh, you know, we have our time sharing or agreement, but if he says, Hey, I want to take her to the convention, can I have her an extra day? Yeah, sure. Yep. What difference does it make to me? And then it's like, uh, there'll be a day when I say, you know, can I pick her up early? Can I have her an extra day? We want to go on a trip. Yeah, sure. So, it's in everybody's best interest that we're reasonable with each other as parents. And um, my daughter needs to see that even though we're divorced, because being and the, <laughs> if they ask you why you got divorced, the answer is because we were not happy being married. And you know what? You're allowed to change your mind about who you want to be married to. It's not because your father cheated on me or he's a piece of shit or um, he's in a cult. Never say that word to your kid. (laughs) Um, It's because being married at first, it made us happy to be married. But after a while, it didn't make us happy to be married to each other because we don't like doing any of the same things. And. I didn't like being a Jehovah's Witness, but daddy likes it. So we just, it didn't make sense for us to be married anymore. Um, So that's that. And I told her, uh, you know, I told her, you know, you're allowed to have as many boyfriends or girlfriends as you want, just one at a time. (laughs) (laughs) Like, you know, you can change your mind. You don't have to lock yourself into a relationship and stay there forever. And so it's okay and it's normal to end a relationship in which you're not happy. And um, the therapist helps so much with that, um, you know, as far as helping her know for sure it's not her fault. She 100% thinks it's Nathan's fault right now, but that's a phase and we're going to work through it. Um <laughs> You know, Poor one Nathan. of my, <laughs> oh yeah, he's the whipping boy, but he's, <laughs> like, so, <"What'd> I do? <laughs> he's so kind to her and she really loves him, but she will not admit it. You could put her feet to the fire. She wouldn't admit it. Yeah. So it's just, I had a client, uh, who's a stepdad tell me, um, children have a biological drive to have their parents together and a step parent is a human uh, guarantee that that won't happen. So of course they're going to direct their negativity and anger toward the step parent. And so I thought that that was really insightful. And, uh, 
Yeah. So, and there's nothing wrong with putting your child in therapy. Uh, sometimes you have to try to, you have to really fight for those resources. Uh, but if you feel like they could use some help processing the situation that they're in with the split between, with the religious divide, um, therapy can be super helpful and there's no too early for that. So a great place to start if you want to do that for your child is to go to the school and talk to the guidance counselor and find out if they have any resources within the school for that. Um, since Amelia has a diagnosis, uh, we for, we have so many meetings. Sometimes you have to fight for it. But um, since she has a diagnosis, she has, um, in Florida, they call it a 504. And so you go and meet with the school and they you meet with like the guidance counselor, the teacher and the principal, you talk about the diagnosis. Then they schedule you a meeting with the circuit psychologist. You meet with her and she qualifies your child for a 504. And that's a form that goes into the school system and they have it forever. And it means that if you come to them and you say, because my child has ADHD, anxiety, whatever, mm -hmm. this is what they're going through right now. And this is their current challenge with it. And you need to accommodate it. And they put the accommodations on that form because if you don't have that, no teacher is obligated to do anything special for your kid. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, every friggin' parent would be asking for special shit for their kids. Sure. So after we got the 504, and there's nothing on it. There is nothing on hers. It's blank because she's fine right now. But if something changes, now we can just go say, hey, we need you to do this. And it's instantly done. So we got the 504, and then we started looking for a therapist on our own. And it's super expensive to Child mm -hmm. therapy is re and her father has amazing insurance and it's really expensive. So we went back to the school and they partnered with, um, an organization in town and now she gets free therapy once a week after school with a licensed mental health counselor and it's free and she'll even come to the session at home if school's on vacation or if we just want her to wow. for free. Wow, yeah, that is tremendous. <laughs> yeah. And I've seen and they play. It's not like there's she's laying on the couch talking about right, all yeah. this stuff. Yeah, they play. But these people really like they're trained special. They know what they're doing and mm -hmm. they can get through to your kids more than you can because your kids don't want to say certain things to you because they don't want to hurt your feelings or mm -hmm. Uh, make you angry or anything. So that's why she'll get mad at Nathan. I didn't even know him when I got divorced. It's my fault I got divorced. She's never been mad at me about it <laughs> because she doesn't want to be mad at me. Right. So um, that that has been really helpful. She has made huge progress with the anxiety thing. And she's just lighter and happier. So no bad can come of it. Those so are fantastic tips yeah. for, I hope it helps. Someone. I'm sure that's going to help somebody because you know, that's something I can't, I, I know I've never been able to speak to. I don't know. I'm not a parent. I don't know anything about the system. I don't have any of these circumstances. And I think that you're the first person that can really think of to speak to all these specifics. And I really think that that's going to help somebody out there who because I, I, this is a struggle that I see a lot of people go through. And um, again, you know, your tips aren't necessarily going to be effective with every child. Every mm -hmm. child is different. Every parent is different. Every situation is different. But we can all learn from each other. And you know, sharing what's working for one person might help somebody else in some way or spark a new idea for somebody else. So I think that's that's absolutely great feedback that um, yeah. I really... well. Maybe one more little thing sure. <laughs> that, um, you know, sometimes we might get like this emotional itch to go to the kingdom hall. Mm -hmm. Like I, I need to go to the meeting or whatever. 
um, don't go with your kid mm. because that's giving them false hope. Oh, you know? wow. Yeah, I can see yeah. that. So, because all they want is for the the three of you or however many are in your family to right. be back at that kingdom hall together and then all these issues go away. Right. Um, so if you have to self-soothe at the kingdom hall, like, do it without them and don't let them know about it. Um, and to, and unless you decide you're like seriously getting reinstated, um, don't, don't do it. Yeah. That really would put yeah. a lot on a kid. Um, yeah. It's, it's not nice. It's not a nice thing. It, you know, it's kind of like, well, let's go hang out with dad all together. And uh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> that gives yeah. a false impression. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. but I didn't really get that itch much. So. <laughs> I went one time and I spent the whole time making notes about all the ridiculous things they were saying. Yeah. So I was like, this is so stupid that no amount of feeling emo is going to make me go back. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. I don't, man, I don't, I don't think I could, I don't think I could keep my mouth shut if I stepped foot into a kingdom (laughs) hall. So it's probably best that I, I don't go to one. You can bet I looked awesome and I had my nose in the air. <laughs> I was, like I was showing off all my tattoos and I stuck my nose in the air and I'm like, yeah, I'm fabulous. Like, cause they expect you to walk in there like crying. I'm oh, like yeah. miserable. You know? <laughs> like, yes. No, that's not, that's not what this is. But it was so annoying cause they're so patronizing. They give you that look. Yes. Oh, like. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I feel bad for you because instant sad been, face. Yeah, yeah. Like I feel bad for you because you're still in this. Or I feel bad for you because you've been dating someone for two years and you can't have sex with them. Like <laughs> 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 So let me ask you. So if you could say anything that you wanted to your family and friends that shun you, is there anything you would say to them? You know, that all was these the- all these people that, that, that used to be part of your life that, you know, I could even see you maybe even going back and, and, you know, you talked about, you know, feeling emo or whatever and going back to a kingdom hall. Like, is there anything you would say to all these people that, that feel some type of way towards you and shun you? That was the hardest question that you asked me on, you know, and you kind of told me how the interview was going to go. Right. Um, because it's a fantasy question mm. because it's impossible. Right. I've tried, I've tried to talk to them. Um, so I guess. Is there anything you would say just for you even, you know, just to kind of yeah. get off your chest? So that's kind of how, where I went with it. So I'm going to focus on my mom and dad because to me, that's the most egregious part of the whole shunning process. Mm-hmm. Um, And I would say I am still the person that I have always been. I'm still the person that you loved and, you know, thought was funny and fun and caring and generous. I'm still the person that you loved and I'm a good moral person and I'm happy and I forgive you. Now, the reason why I can't ever say that is because it would be, I don't need your forgiveness, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's all about them. Right. But for me, I would want to say that because now like it, it took a long time for me to get to those, those words, but over time and having objectivity and remember that when you were in the cult, you shunned people too. Mm -hmm. And I'm ashamed of that now, but I've reconnected with a lot of those people and I apo- I've apologized to them mm-hmm. and they're not angry. No, they get it. And then first thing they do is hug me and tell me never to think such a thing again. Mm-hmm. So, um, I would say I forgive you and, um, they're doing what they think is right even though it's very wrong, they really think it's right. Because would you cut out your child unless you had a really, really, came from a really real place? Right. So 
that's kind of how I was able to arrive at the forgiveness. Yeah. No, and you know, what is it? Forgiveness is for you, not for them. Um, yeah. You know, it helps you to kind of let go and to accept what is, um, you know, ultimately, even if you, like you said, even if you told them, well, I don't need your forgiveness, that's fine, whatever. But we, if, if we hold on to that forever, what does they say? Like resentment is like drinking the poison and hoping the other person dies. You know, yeah. it, it, it's, it's going to eat at you. So at some point for your own sanity, you know, trying to understand them, trying to understand where they're coming from. It doesn't mean you have to agree, mm -hmm. but, but acknowledging our own part and doing similar things in our lives. We're all just human. And it's, uh, you know, some, at some point we have to kind of let that go on some level. Um, yeah. And being free and happy is why I did all this yes. and anger and resentment. Yeah. Uh, ruin those things. Absolutely. So I'm not going to do anything that's going to ruin the life that I've made and the happiness that I've found because it was very expensive. Yes, absolutely. So what's yeah. one thing that you've learned since leaving the religion that's really impacted your life for the better? Um. It sounds like you've had quite the journey of discovery and yeah. Uh, is there anything that kind of stands out that's really helped you or? Yeah. Um, no one. Okay. Well, um, so I was talking to my therapist mm -hmm. and this is when I first left. And so when you're oh, in a cult of any kind, I would assume, but I know when you're a witness, um, they're so sure, they're 100% sure that they're right. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't believe that anymore, then it can kind of feel like what, th then what's true mm -hmm. and what's right. And she said, Chloe, nobody knows. And that was like major for me. And it, it's so uh, liberating because nobody knows if they say they know for sure they're delusional. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows. So it really doesn't matter. Uh, doc doctrinally what you decide works for you. Um, if it makes you happy and works for you and makes your family happy and helps you be a good member of the human human race, Good, that that's fine to believe that, but it doesn't really matter because nobody knows for sure. And um, I would say that that was one of the most important realizations that I had. And it's funny because when I taught Amelia that, she was like, "Yeah, obviously," you know, like because <laughs> the as mouth of babes. Yeah, because when you're a kid, you know you don't know shit. Yes. And so we were actually talking about, you know, the how the universe, She start, she's obsessed with space. So she started saying, you know, I think the stars came from like one big star that exploded. And the other stars are like these little sparkles that came flying into space. Mm -hmm. And so I explained about the Big Bang, you know, in my rudimentary science mm -hmm. understanding. And she said, that's awesome. And I said, and what do Jehovah's Witnesses believe about it? And she explained it to me in detailed accuracy based on what they taught her. So I know they're teaching her, right? Mm -hmm. So I said, so let me ask you this, Amelia. Was anybody there when the universe was created? And she said, no. I said, then can anyone know for sure if either of those things is right? And she said, no. I said, yeah. So nobody knows. She busts in the house and she says to Nathan, Nathan, nobody knows how the universe got started because no one was there. <laughs> nobody knows. <laughs> you know, but so to be comfortable with not knowing. That's such a beautiful thing to be able to find in life because we don't yeah. have to know everything. It's okay. It's okay because it doesn't matter. It has yeah. no impact on our happiness now 
whether or not we know what happens to us when we die or yeah, I just can't help but smile because you keep you keep saying the word happiness, and I just think it's obviously you know that is such a theme in your life has been you know finding happiness and and really happiness is the ultimate currency. Happiness is what we're all going for. Like when you look at there's a book I I loved called Happier by uh, Tal Ben Shahar, and it was one that really helped me in my awakening process and. It was just the point that, you know, happiness is why we do all the things we do. We're Mm -hmm. looking for happiness Mm -hmm. and we try to find it by putting on all these different things. But, you know, happiness is just a state of being. You can choose to be happy in Mm -hmm. in a lot of different circumstances. And it's just I I really like that you just keep bringing up happiness. That's what it all comes down to. Um, Yes. But why would you go through all of that? If not in the pursuit of happy, it was kind of funny when I first left and then I first experienced happiness on any level. I'd said to Tony, the artist, I said, now I understand why everybody's in pursuit of this. Like, this is awesome. Yes, you know? it is. There's an interesting thing about happiness that Nathan taught me uh, that Buddhists believe because, you know, that's what it's all about mm-hmm. is yep. personal happiness. And, um, so they do this thing, they chant this chant, it's um, Nam Yoho Renge Kyo, and they just say it over and over again, really rhythmically for like an hour, okay? Okay. And I'm like, what is the point of this? Because they're, he, his Buddhist branch is not Tibetan, they don't worship Buddha, they don't worship anybody, and they don't believe in a personal God. So I'm like, who are you chanting to? Like, what is going on? And so one of the ladies explained it to me. She said, um, we're chanting into the universe. So nam myoho renge kyo translates into devotion to uh, the lotus flower, not the pursuit of knowledge and listening to the sound of the universe. And I'm like, so like hippy dippy that I was like, oh, tell me about listening to the sound of the universe. That sounds <laughs> awesome. That's a so, cool thought. Yeah. Right. So their theory is that the universe has a literal sound. It has a rhythm. It has a flow, like a bloodstream, mm-hmm. you know, like that whoosh. Yeah. And so we want to do things. We want to accomplish things and get places in life. And most notably, we want to achieve happiness. Mm -hmm. And so we fight and fight and fight and fight and fight and struggle and struggle to achieve that. But if we just listen to the sound of the universe and go with the flow, we wouldn't have to fight so much could just let it lead us there and so that really resonated with me and I don't like they believe that chanting is physically syncing them up with that sound and I don't really buy that but there is something to be said for not having to fight so hard yeah it's but, mindfulness it's being present it's uh... mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah just like being. what's going to make you happy? Yeah. Why don't you just do that? Yeah. You know, well, that's awesome. don't you? Yeah, it was awesome. I loved it. So I still don't know. I don't think that I believe in God. I totally threw the baby out with the bathwater with that. Um, and I don't want anything to do with Christianity. But I love listening to people talk about their faith mm-hmm. because they're are some what you might call true Christians in this world because they actually act loving and (laughs) Christ-like. Right, right. Yep. And and the witnesses are the Pharisees, you know, straining out the net and gulping down the camel. Absolutely. So just like be open-minded, do what makes you happy, and... Don't hurt anyone. And what more can you ask for in life, really? Love others, do no harm, and go be happy. That's how I end every podcast. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yes, exactly. (laughs) 
So, okay. So talking about all this happiness, what do you enjoy about your new life since leaving and what dreams do you have going forward? Well, I want to keep working in the art community and I want to expand that role. Um, right now I'm working on being a performance artist, but then who knows? I mean, they need a lot of support, you know, advocacy and awareness and, um, you can use art to reach people and communicate about things that are so important. So I don't know where I'll go with that, but I want to stay involved in that. And, um, of course I want to be a mom again and you know, that's going to be cool. We already have our baby name picked out and I don't <laughs> mind telling you because we tell everybody cause it's awesome. Okay. Whether, <laughs> whether, okay. We're dating two weeks. Nathan asked me if we can have a baby. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, yes. And he said, okay, whether it's a boy or a girl, can we name it Bowie? Oh, so nice. that is dope. I'm like, yes, we're doing that. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. So we're excited. So we're always talking about Bowie and planning for Bowie. And, you know, like I want Amelia. She's going to, she's going to go to college and she's going to, She's in Florida ballet. It's like the one, you know, and she's going to stay with them and pursue that dream. And I'm going to go to college um, because I want to be a therapist because like I know how much it helped me yeah. and I want to help other people. Um, and if I can specialize in people like me, that would be awesome. <laughs> yes. You know, who knows, but I really would love, like, that's been a dream of mine for a long time and I was never allowed to pursue it. And so even if I'm like a hundred, when I graduate, I'm still going to do it. I think that's an amazing dream. I mean, I think who, who wouldn't want to help? I mean, I think a lot of people actually go into therapy with, for one thing, a lot of people go into it to help themselves, but also to help people like themselves. I think that's such a, a beautiful and noble thing to want to do in life. Thanks. It's it's really fun to look forward to the future. <laughs> yeah, it is, and, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And I and I never would have like had plans for myself. Like if you had asked me this five years ago, it would have been well, this for Amelia and this for the congregation and this for my Bible student, but nothing for me. But I'm yeah. like, oh, no, my life is going to be dope because I'm going to do this stuff for me, too. So that is awesome. Yeah. Well, I hope that you get to achieve those things. Um, it's really I've really enjoyed getting to talk to you. Um, is there anything that that I didn't ask you or that you wanted to say? that maybe, um, you know, didn't come up during the course of the conversation? I feel like I've just been going on and on too much, but I do want to say that there is, like we talked about Me Too and that phenomenon, mm -hmm. that's happening with us. That's happening with people like us. Um, and Things are coming to light. You know, Leah Remini did her thing. The Australian Royal Commission did their thing. It's Stuff is on the news constantly. Mm -hmm. Cults and Extremes, Extreme Beliefs on A&E did their thing. You're doing your podcast. That amazing movie, Apostasy, came out. Mm -hmm. So all of these things are happening, and it's because people like us do you remember being a kid and people got disfellowship and they just went away and they yes. were gone? We're not doing that. We're not just going to go hide and be ashamed and be in the darkness. And we're the ones who can, ex we know for a fact who these people are and the, and the bad things. And we're the ones who can speak up and help and expose them. So like what you're doing, I know it, it's a lot of work and it's a cumbersome thing, but please don't stop doing it. And for all the people out there listening, you have a story to tell and you should tell it. And even if that just means writing it down in a journal for yourself, or if you're a musician, or if you're a painter, or, or if you 
um, are a parent and you use your story to help your kids, like you have a very important story behind you. And by telling it, you can help yourself and you can help other people. So everybody tell your story and don't be ashamed because you didn't do anything wrong. Wow, and that's, that's how I feel about it. So that's what I would want to say. That's uh, that's very powerful. Um, I couldn't agree more. I, I think story is everything. And, uh, you know, I, I like the, um, the quote that a man with an experience is not at the mercy of a man with an opinion. Um, mm. By putting our experiences out there, um, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses can argue doctrine all they want. They can argue till you know you're they're blue in the face, but what Jehovah's Witnesses can't argue is experience, and they can't shut up our stories, and they can't. <laughs> that the, there's not a lot they can say when we relate the th- the awful things that we've all been through um, mm. at the hands of, of the cult, and um, you know you, you you can't silence us all. So no. Um, it's a beautiful thing to be a, be a part of this. I thank you so much for telling your story, for wanting to be a part of it too. And I, I think it's beautiful the way you encourage people to you know, put your story out there however it fits you. I did podcasts because podcasts are, are, are my jam. <laughs> That's what I, <laughs> I listen to all day at work. Um, but for other people, if you're, you know, like you're doing this performance art uh, piece, that there are people out there who paint Uh, who do music, whatever, you know, just do your thing, do it your way, but put your story out there because Mm -hmm. other people need to hear it. And uh, I mean, I get comments and emails from people all the time and it's not just ex witnesses. It's people from other religions. It's people who are just curious or who have family and all this stuff really does reach people and, and touch lives far more lives than we ever touched going door to door as Jehovah's Witnesses. Oh, yeah. Tell me about it. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, thank you for letting me add my story to the sound of the universe. How great was that advice at the end about co-parenting with a witness? I really appreciated her sharing that, even though obviously there's no one right or wrong way to handle everything. And obviously, you know, she's dealing with her child and everyone has their own temperament and their own circumstances. But I, I really thought there was a lot of hard won wisdom in those words. And you can see that she's gained it through coming through a lot of her double life and, and the, the things surrounding her life as a Jehovah's Witness in order to find a life that is uniquely her own. And as mentioned at the outset, Chloe actually has her own personal story that has been encompassed in a presentation, a a live presentation that she's written and will be, be performing herself called Full Powerless. And as I said, this um, I wanted to announce that this will be taking place on Saturday, May the 18th and Sunday, May the 19th. On Saturday, May the 18th, it will be at 8 p.m. And on Sunday, May the 19th, it will be at 5 p.m. And this will be occurring at the Babs Lab in the Cork Arts District North at 603 King Street in Jacksonville, Florida. So if you're in the Jacksonville area and you'd like to go see an original um, performance piece done by a former Jehovah's Witness about her life, um, I know it's something that I wish I could see, but I don't live in Jacksonville and I can't quite make that trip. But anyway, it will be taking place on Saturday, the 18th at eight o'clock and on Sunday, May 19th at 5 PM. And, uh, I really hope that she has a great performance and that things go really well. And that hopefully some in her audience can relate and maybe find help, uh, through her presentation and her performance. So, uh, I just think it's really cool that, that she's doing this. I'm not sure if I've ever heard of anybody else doing something like this. So again, that will be at Babs Lab in the Cork Arts District North in Jacksonville, Florida. The music that you heard clips of right before and after the interview 
That music was done by her husband, Nathan Smith. Uh, the first clip was from the song Freak by the band that he's in called Secret Cigarettes. And the second clip was from the song Preoccupied with Whether You Could from his solo project called Cats to Whip. I'll have links to the, in the show notes for both uh, the songs, the albums, the bands, everything will be right there so that you can get more music if you, if you like. Uh, also, you can go to shunpodcast.com to leave a message of support for Chloe. You can also find the resources mentioned, including the music. Um, or you can also do things like uh, picking up a t-shirt or hoodie that supports the show. You can also send me an email there or even a voicemail that I can include on the episode. If you have a question, you can use the voicemail uh, app there on the right there on the website and uh, you know go ahead and record a question and and I'll include it. Follow us at Shun Podcast, one word, on YouTube, Instagram, or Twitter. You can also join the Shun Podcast Facebook group and get into interesting conversations in a supportive environment and find out things about the podcast first. If you want to hear my story, you can do so on the podcast called This JW Life. There's two ways that you can support the podcast. If you appreciate the podcast and if it's helping you in some way, you can help it by supporting financially at patreon.com slash shunned. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash shunned. Uh, supporting the Patreon helps me to keep this going, and it means the world to me uh, that people would actually kind of get involved in this with me in that way. Uh, in fact, I'll shout you out here if you sign up. First names only, though. I don't I don't give last names because I never know anybody's situation and and uh you know, what they might be, if they might be uh, physically in, but mentally out, and I don't want to out anybody. So uh, first names only. Uh, but we can always use more support. And I actually have some really cool rewards for patrons coming in the next month. Um, those in my Facebook group know about what I've been planning and, and helped with feedback. So I'm just waiting on the arrival of a package. <laughs> and then I'll be announcing some things in the next podcast or two, depending on production time. You can also leave a five-star review on iTunes or wherever you get podcasts uh, for Shunned and also for this JW Life. And those reviews help others to find the podcast and get the help that they need. And something that I offer, both for individual and, and groups, I offer individual and group coaching programs uh, that help people get past their past, uh, to help people find themselves, to help people get unstuck in the life you know that we have after these cults. It's easy to uh, get out and then find yourself stuck repeating familiar roles and programs, uh, scripts that were programmed into us. So uh, it's it's something that we all need help for at some point. Uh, it's not easy to go this path alone. And so if you'd like to work with me individually or in a group, I am a certified coach and I want to help. So go to shunpodcast.com slash coaching and you'll find the information there that you need. We're going to go ahead and close the episode out today with the song No Hell Yet by Fair Voyeur. Uh, you can find a link to her song, to the Patreon page for the show, to resources mentioned and more, not just on the website, but if you're listening in a podcast app, you can probably get it all in the app by looking at the description. So as we end all episodes, love others, do no harm, and go be happy. We're cursed God.